Welcome back to Intersections. I have to apologize, it's been a couple of months, but with everything going on, the pandemic, the economic collapse, the violence, I needed a couple of months to just sit by myself and ponder how we got into this mess and what's a way forward for people of faith. And so that's what I come to you today. In looking back in my ponderings, I've come to the conclusion that our greatest failure as a church is that we haven't affected society. We really haven't affected how modern society lives. In fact, our modern society still worships the golden calf. What do I mean by that? I mean, if our society creates God, a small g God, to justify their privilege, their power, their race, their whatever. That's a golden calf. If you create a God in your mind that justifies you being better off than someone else, that's a golden calf. And the universal thing about golden calves is they're too small to be a God. They're just too small. So where do we go? Well, we got 60 days left before the, what I would suggest is the greatest decision in my lifetime about the future of our society, and I would argue about the future of the world. Now, don't get your hankles up. I'm not going to tell you which way to make that decision. What I'm going to suggest is some things you bear in mind as we face these 60 days. Let's go. First of all, if we're going to use scripture as a reference, you've got to understand that in the Bible, some numbers mean a lot more than just the number, right? And so seven, seven is obviously often used in scripture to mean perfect. And six means evil because it's less than seven, so you're less than perfect. And three, of course, has special meaning all in and of itself. And then there's 40. When you see 40 in scripture, it's a big flaming sign that life is changing, life is being transformed. Go back and look in scripture, all the times 40, 40, 40. And then there's 50. There's one huge occasion for 50 in a couple of different places. But the one I'm talking about is 50 is the year of the Jubilee where everyone is made equal. Something we've never been willing to do. But 60. If you look up 60 in scripture, you don't see a whole bunch of references, but there is one that we might be able to use as a metaphor for these times. 60 happens to be the largest dimension of the temple that Solomon was ordered to construct for God. And so let's use that idea of constructing a temple, just as a metaphor. Because I gotta tell you, the temples we've built so far are houses of cards. They're tumbling down. Why? Because we build them on shifting sand. So let's, let's go forward and think about how do you build something so it doesn't fall apart under stress? What I'm going to suggest that what you do is you establish really, really, really solid cornerstones, not shifting sand, cornerstones that anchor the foundation on which you're going to build your life. And here we're talking metaphorically, of course, but I'm talking about what is your faith going to lie on? What is going to be the grounding of your faith? And so over the next few weeks, I'm going to suggest different cornerstones that we plant as a foundation that we're going to build our way forward on. And the first cornerstone, the one for today, you're not going to like. I'll grant you, none of us Americans like this concept. But that first cornerstone is repentance. Yeah, repentance. Repent for the end is at near. No, no. Repentance in the Bible, repent means to change directions. If the way you've been going through life is corrupted, the image of God, then you need to change directions. And so there's a, there's a great biblical story I want to talk about. You know it. It's Jonah. In fact, I titled this video segment as Jonah are us because we are Jonah. Remember Jonah? 
Jonah was a little known prophet that God spoke to said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent. And what did Jonah do? Jonah went the other way. He absolutely went the other way to avoid because he hated the people in Nineveh. How could God possibly suggest that he should go to Nineveh? And so he went the other way. He was so eager not to do what God was calling him to do, he bound himself on a ship. The ship got in trouble. He even offered himself up for a sacrifice to appease the storm. Little gods again, right? Little G God. Got thrown into the water. Then, you know, instead of drowning, this big whale swallowed him up. Well, they call it a beast. And eventually the beast puked him up on the land. So there's Jonah covered in whale vomit on the land and he finally accepts God's call to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent. So he shakes off that whale vomit and he gets up and goes. And what happens? As soon as he gets to Nineveh, to the people he hates, to the people he despises, to the people he couldn't possibly talk to and says, God wants us to change, God wants us to repent, they do. Just walking around saying, you know, God wants us to change how we are living is enough to cause the people to repent. What does Jonah do? Jonah goes out on a hillside and pouts. He pouts because it was so easy to do this task that he never wanted to do for God. My favorite biblical theologian, historical theologian, John Dominic Crossan. And he says about a favorite gospel story of mine, the road to Emos, is that Emos never happened, but Emos always happens. And so my take on that is this story of Jonah, which was offered up as a metaphor for us, never ever happened. And yet, it happens every day. Every day, God is calling us to bring this message to our society of repenting, to change our ways, to go to become a people that God is calling us to become, and we turn and go the other way for a whole host of reasons. It's too hard, or we can't possibly imagine the people God is calling us to be are worthy of being. Jonah are us. And what I suggest we need to do is we need to get up off of that beach, shake off the whale vomit that we're covered in, and go to our friends and neighbors and the people of Nineveh that we live in and say we need to repent. We need to become a people that instead of trying to remake God into our image, remake ourselves into who God would have us be. And I would further suggest that the first person we go to is that one that stares us back in the mirror we look in and start there. Repentance is to change life's direction. It's not to be confused with confession and absolution which we are the easy practices we often engage in where we confess a sin and we automatically get blessed for it and we don't have to worry about it again. No. Repentance is the life journey of daily struggling to become the person that God is calling us to be. That's the call from God, to repent, to come be my people. So, we need to do that today, but not just today. We need to do it tomorrow and all the tomorrows that are to come. And perhaps, just perhaps, by building our faith on this cornerstone and the ones that follow, we might actually transform the society we're living in. So that's it for today. I'll be back to you in a week, and we'll talk about the next cornerstone. In the meantime, blessings on your journey, on your pondering, of how to have a faith that is worthy of the God 
that you are. Take care.